But another way to say that is wisdom is a constantly expanding and evolving set of metrics. So Which metric means that there is something in you that is recognizing a new metric yeah. that's important that isn't part of that metric set. So there's a certain kind of connection, discernment, yeah. awareness. And this is a, this, this iterative is a game theory. There's a girdles and completeness theorem, right? Which is if the system, if the set of things is consistent, it won't be complete. So we're going to keep adding to it, which is why we were saying earlier, I don't think it's not beautiful. And especially if you were just saying one of the metrics you want to optimize for at the individual level is becoming, right? That we're becoming more. Well, that then becomes true for the civilization and our metric sets as well. Yeah. And our definition of how to think about a meaningful life and a meaningful civilization. I can tell you what some of my favorite metrics are. What's that? Uh, well, love is obviously not a metric. It's How much like, you can bench? Yeah. It's a good metric. Yeah, I want to optimize that across the entire population, starting with infants. Um, <laughs> so in the same way that love isn't a metric, but you could make metrics that look at certain parts of it. The thing I'm about to say isn't a metric, but it's a, it's a consideration. Because I thought about this a lot. I, I don't think there is a metric, a right one. Um, I think that every metric by itself without this thing we talked about of the continuous improvement becomes a paperclip maximizer. I think that's why what the idea of false idol means in terms of the model of reality not being reality, then my sacred relationship is to reality itself, which also binds me to the unknown forever, to the known, but also to the unknown. And there's a sense of sacredness connected to the unknown that creates an epistemic humility that is always seeking not just to optimize the thing I know, but to learn new stuff and to be open to perceive reality directly. So my model never becomes sacred. My model is useful. My, so the model can't be the false idol. Correct. Yeah. And this is why the first verse of the Tao Te Ching is the Tao that is nameable is not the eternal Tao. The naming then can become the source of the 10,000 things that if you get too carried away with it can actually obscure you from paying attention to reality beyond in the models. It sounds a lot, a lot like Stephen Wolfram, but in a different language, much more poetic. I well, can imagine that. No, I'm, I'm referring, to, I'm joking, but there's uh, echoes of cellular automata, which you can't name. You can't construct a, a good model of cellular automata. You can only watch in awe. I apologize. I'm distracting your train of thought horribly and miserably, making it diff By the way, something robots aren't good at and uh, dealing with the uncertainty of uneven ground. You've been okay so far. You've been doing wonderfully. So what's your favorite metrics? <laughs> okay, so that's so, why I know you're not a robot. So I have you're a passing the Turing test. So one metric, and there are problems with this, but one metric that I like to just, as a thought experiment to consider is, because you're actually asking, we're, we're, I mean, I know you ask your guests about the meaning of life, because ultimately when you're design, when you're saying what is a desirable civilization, you can't answer that without answering what is a meaningful human life and to say what is a good civilization because it's going to be in relationship to that, right? Um, and then you have whatever your answer is, how do you know? What is the what is the epistemic basis for, for postulating that? Um, There's also a whole other reason for asking that question. I don't, I mean, that, that doesn't even apply to you whatsoever, which is it's, Interesting how few people have been asked questions like it. We 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 joke about these questions as silly. Right. It's it's funny to watch a person. And if I was more of an asshole, I would really stick on that question. Right. It's it's a silly question in some sense, but if, like we haven't really considered what it means. Just a more concrete version of that question is what is what is a better world? What is the kind of world we're trying to create? Really? Have you really thought about okay, the kind I'll of give you some kind of simple answers to that that are meaningful to me. But let me do the societal indices first because they're fun. Yes. We should take a note of this meaningful thing because it's important to come back to. Um, are you reminding me to ask you about the meaning of life? <laughs> Noted. I am. <laughs> let me jot that down. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, well, because I think I stopped tracking at like 25 open threads. Um, okay. Let it all burn. One index that I find very interesting is the inverse correlation of addiction within the society. The more a society produces addiction within the people in it, the less healthy I think the society is as a pretty fundamental metric. 
And so the more the individuals feel that there are less compulsive things in com compelling them to behave in ways that are destructive to their own values, uh, and insofar as a civilization is conditioning and influencing the individuals within it, the inverse of addiction. Um, Broadly defined. Correct. Addiction. What's it? Uh, yeah. Compulsive behavior that is destructive towards things that we value. Yeah. I think that's, that's a very really interesting one to think that's about. That's a really interesting one, yeah. And this is then also where comfort and addiction start to get very close. And the ability to go in the other direction from addiction is the ability to be exposed to hypernormal stimuli and not go down the path of desensitizing to other stimuli and needing that hypernormal stimuli, which does involve a kind of hormesis. So I do think the civilization of the future has to create something like ritualized discomfort. And... Um, ritualized discomfort. Yeah. I think that's what the sweat lodge and the vision quest and the solo journey and the ayahuasca journey and the sun dance were. I think it's even a big part of what yoga asana was, um, is to make beings that are resilient and strong, they have to overcome some things. To make beings that can control their own mind and fear, they have to face some fears. But we don't want to th put everybody in war or real trauma. And yet we can see that the most fucked up people we know had childhoods of a lot of trauma. But some of the most incredible people we know had childhoods of a lot of trauma, whether or not they happen to make it through and overcome that or not. So how do we get the benefits of the stealing of character and the resilience and the whatever that happened from the difficulty without traumatizing people? A certain kind of ritualized discomfort like that us. not only has us overcome something by ourselves, but overcome it together with each other where nobody bails when it gets hard because the other people are there. So it's both a resilience of the individuals and a resilience of the bonding. So I think we'll keep getting more and more comfortable stuff, but we have to also develop resilience in the presence of that um, for the anti-addiction direction and the fullness of character um, and the trustworthiness to others. So you have to be uh, consistently injecting discomfort into the system, ritualize I mean, this sounds like uh, you have to imagine Sisyphus happy. You have to uh, imagine Sisyphus with his rock uh, optimally resilient from a metrics perspective in society. So we we want we want to constantly be throwing rocks at ourselves. Not constantly. Uh, you didn't have to frequently. Do, um, periodically. Periodically. Yes. And there's different levels of intensity, different periodicities. Now, I do not think this should be imposed by states. Uh, I think it should emerge from cultures. And I think the cultures are developing people that understand the value of it. So the people, so there is both a, a cultural cohesion to it, but there's also a voluntarism because the people value the thing that is being developed. They understand it. And that's where condition, so it's conditioning. It's conditioning some of these, uh, some of these values and... Conditioning is a bad word because we like our idea of sovereignty, but when we recognize the language that we speak and the words that we think in and the, and the patterns of thought built into that language and the aesthetics that we like and so much is conditioned in us just based on where we're born, you can't not condition people. So all you can do is take more responsibility for what the conditioning factors are and then you have to think about this question of what is a meaningful human life because we're – Unlike the other animals born into environment that they're genetically adapted for, we're building new environments that we were not, not adapted for, and then we're becoming affected by those. So then we have to say, well, what kinds of environments, digital environments, physical environments, social environments, would we want to create that would develop the healthiest, happiest, most moral, noble, meaningful people? And what are even those sets of things that matter? So you end up getting deep existential consideration at the heart of civilization design when you start to realize how powerful we're becoming and how much what we're building it in service towards matters. Before I pull it, I think three threads you just laid down. Uh, is there another metric. metric index that you're interested I'll in? I'll tell you one more that I really like. There's a, there's a number, but the, one, the, the next one that comes to mind is, uh, I have to make a very quick model. Uh, Healthy human bonding, say 
we were in a travel type setting. My positive emotional states and your positive emotional states would most of the time be correlated, your negative emotional states and mine. And so you start laughing, I start laughing, you start crying, my eyes might tear up. And we would call that the compassion compersion axis. I would, this is a model I find. I find useful. So compassion is when you're feeling something negative, I feel some pain, I feel some empathy, something in relationship. Compersion is when you do well, I'm stoked for you, right? Like I actually feel happiness you at your happiness. Down. I like compersion. Yeah, the That's fact great. that it's such an uncommon word in English is actually a problem culturally. Because um, I feel that often, and I think that's a really good feeling to feel and maximize for, actually. Yeah. That's actually the metric I'm going to say. Oh, wow. Is the compassion compersion axis is the thing I would optimize for. Now, there is a state where my emotional states and your emotional states are just totally decoupled. And that is like sociopathy. I don't want to hurt you, but I don't care if I do or for you to do well or whatever. But there's a worse state, and it's extremely common, which is where they're inversely coupled, where my positive emotions correspond to your negative ones and vice versa. And that is the... I, I would call it the jealousy sadism axis. The jealousy axis is when you're doing really well, I feel something bad. I feel taken away from, less than, upset, envious, whatever. And that's so common. But I think of it as kind of a low-grade psychopathology that we've just normalized. The idea that I'm actually upset at the happiness or fulfillment or success of another is like a profoundly fucked up thing. No, we shouldn't shame it and repress it so it gets worse. We should study it. Where does it come from? And it comes from our own insecurities and stuff. And But then the next part that everybody knows is really fucked up is just on the same axis. It's the same f inverted, which is to the jealousy or the envy is the I feel badly when you're doing well. The sadism side is I actually feel good when you lose. Or when you're in pain, I feel some happiness that's associated. And you can see when someone feels jealous, sometimes – they feel jealous with a partner and then they feel they want that partner to get it. Revenge comes up or something. So sadism is really like jealousy is one step on the path to sadism from the healthy compassion compersion axis. So I would like to see a society that is inversely, that is conditioning sadism and jealousy inversely, right? The, the lower that amount and the more the compassion compersion. And if I had to summarize that very simply, I'd say it would optimize for compersion. Which is, because no, notice, that's not just saying love for you, where I might be self-sacrificing and miserable and I love people, but I kill myself, mm -hmm. which I don't think anybody thinks a great idea. Or happiness, where I might be sociopathically happy, where I'm causing problems all over the place, or even sadistically happy. But it's a coupling, right? That I'm actually feeling happiness in relationship to yours, and even in causal relationship, where I, my own agentic desire to get happier wants to support you too. Mm -hmm. That's actually, speaking of another pickup line, uh, that's quite honestly what I, as, as a guy who's single, this is, this is going to come out very ridiculous because it's like, oh yeah, where's your girlfriend, bro? But that's what I look for in a relationship because it's like, it's so much, it's so, it's such an amazing life where you actually get joy from another person's success and they get joy from your success. And then it becomes like, you don't actually need to succeed much for that to have a, like a, 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 like a cycle of just like happiness that just increases like exponentially. It's weird. So like just be, just enjoying the, the happiness of others, the success of others. So this, this is like the, um, let's call this, cause the first person that drilled this into my head is Rogan, Joe Rogan. He was the embodiment of that. Cause I saw somebody who was uh, successful rich and nonstop true i mean you could tell when somebody's full of shit and somebody's not really genuinely enjoying the success of his friends that that was weird to me that was interesting and the, i mean the way you're kind of speaking to it the, the reason joe stood out to me is i guess i haven't witnessed genuine expression of that often in this culture of just real joy for others i mean part of that has to do with there hasn't been many channels where you can watch or listen to people being their authentic selves so i'm sure there's a bunch of people who live life with compersion they probably don't seek public attention also but the 
that that was that, you know, yeah if if there was any word that could express what what i've learned from joe why he's been a, a, a really inspiring figure is, is that compersion and i wish our world was uh had a lot more of that because then it may i mean my own so, so, sorry to, to, to go on a small tangent but like you're speaking how society should function but i feel like if you optimize for that metric in your own personal life you're going to uh, live a truly fulfilling life. I don't know what the right word to use, but that's a really good way to live life. You will also learn what gets in the way of it right. and how to work with it, that if you wanted to help try to build systems at scale or apply Facebook or exponential technologies to do that, you would have more actual depth of real knowledge of what that takes. And this is... You know, as you mentioned that there's this virtuous cycle between when you get stoked on other people doing well and then they have a similar relationship to you and everyone is in the process of building each other up. Uh, and this is what I would say the healthy version of competition is versus the unhealthy version. The healthy version, right, the, the root, I believe it's a Latin word that means to strive together. And it's that impulse to, of becoming where I want to become more, but I recognize that there's actually a, a hormesis. There's a challenge that is needed for me to be able to do that. But that means that, yes, there's an impulse where I'm trying to get ahead. Maybe I'm even trying to win, but I actually want a good opponent. And I want them to get ahead too, because that is where my ongoing becoming happens. And the win itself will get boring very quickly. The ongoing becoming is where there's aliveness. And for the ongoing becoming, they need to have it too. And that's the strive together. The, so in the healthy competition, I'm stoked when they're doing really well because my becoming is supported by it. Mm 